Hi, I'm Kirsty McGregor. I'm the Executive European Editor at Vogue Business. I have been at Vogue Business for a couple of years. I oversee the UK and European content there. Uh, so we cover a lot to do with how emerging and more established designers are faring in the UK, Europe and in the wider markets as well. Before that, I was the editor of Draper's Magazine. It's a UK retail focused publication. So um, there we, talk, we spoke a lot about Brexit's impact on the, uh, the designers, on retailers and on manufacturers. Hello, I'm Stavros Karelis and I'm the founder and creative director of Machine A. Uh, Machine A is a multi-brand concept store uh, that is based in London and Shanghai and we work with a big number of emerging designers, young designers, um, uh, British and international ones, uh, alongside with a lot of uh, established brands. Um, so over the years, uh, we have experienced quite a lot in terms of uh, Brexit, um, which we're here to discuss about. Hi, I'm Stefano Martinetto, co-founder and CEO of Tomorrow, a brand accelerator and incubator platform. Um, with interest in uh, insurgent brands, uh, both British and global. Um, our experience uh, with Brexit has been quite uh, significant and I'm happy to discuss uh, the learnings here with you. I think we were going to kick off by talking about the, uh, all of the benefits that we've seen from Brexit so far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have there been any? None. I was struggling to think of one. <sighs> I've been thinking about it for the past three days, uh, because obviously this is one of the topics of today's conversation. And I have to be honest, I can't find a single one. Um, yeah. And that's pretty sad. Uh, it feels like some of the free trade agreements that have been brought in have, you know, they've kind of compensated for what was lost, but it's not brought additional benefits. And then you have all of the red tape that's been added on. It just has made, you know, post-Brexit, post-COVID life for designer is so difficult. I completely agree with that. I think um, I was thinking overall in the last um, period of time about if there is any advantages or any benefits coming out of Brexit. And uh, thinking in our world, you know, like of designers, of retail, even of friends, of people that we know of, that they're not necessarily within our industry, uh, to see how their lives have changed for something better. And for sure, everyone can answer the same uh, with the same answer is there is no benefit, you know, coming out of Brexit. No, not any obvious one, but I don't think also uh, that has uh, supported businesses in any um, in any better way or has benefited anyone's lives whatsoever. I believe one of the big trade off for Brexit was the, you know, suggestion we might have had a free trade agreement with the largest mm. markets, including, of course, the <laughs> USA ones which never materialize and mm. it doesn't look like it's going to materialize anytime soon. So, you know, if that's not um, a possibility, um, all I've seen is, is a substantial change in the way we do business with other costs and red tape, as you said. Uh, we have experienced the sad uh, departures of many international citizens who were mm -hmm. calling London home and the difficult uh, um, of, of other talents uh, to access this market. Um, we all lost, I guess, a lot of friends mm -hmm. on a you know, daily life uh, who decided to live somewhere else. So ultimately, um, and I'm aware in the service industry, Brexit uh, uh, was a big contributor essentially for the advice to go through the difficulties of navigating the, the treaty. Uh, but in our industry, there's, there's definitely not one. Yeah, and we're now, what, four years on? And it feels like, you know, obviously there was a pandemic, uh, which took priority for a while, but it, it does feel like there's been very little kind of spoken about or progress in recent years mm -hmm. in terms of trying to unpack some of those, you know, it's such a, it's so many complex rules. It's so difficult for businesses mm -hmm. to work out Absolutely. the country of origin rules around trading and what they have to pay customs on and where they have to pay taxes and uh, and where's the you know has there been any improvement I, I i haven't seen anything visible in the last sort of year or so that looks like it's going to get you know better anytime soon surely that's got to be a priority i mean i when when you were saying this i even to this day i remember so uh vividly when we had 
uh, to start our business with the new rules applying, you know, about Brexit. And as you very well said, it was such a complex legislation where all the finance and accounting and actually people couldn't couldn't absorb or couldn't understand what actually in reality does mean. You had to unpack laws that they have been applied for, what, 40 years, mm -hmm. you know, into changing everything, changing all the systems. It was an extremely complex exercise, especially that first, first period of time, mm -hmm. which I, I have to say, and I have to mention that, that uh, thank God, in my case, as Machine A, um, we already, it was just the very, very early beginning that we became part of uh, actually Tomorrow Group. Um, and we, yeah. thank, thank God, uh, had some uh, great legal and finance advice of how we can navigate this extremely complex period. Um, I remember that the first time, the first months, because as a retailer, uh, you're dealing with so many brands and designers that you um, buying from European countries. So all the goods were arriving uh, uh, to start the season in already super complicated period of time, financially speaking, uh, and uh, so politically because we had COVID at that point. So um, to, to, to have to deal with, uh, with something that you, no one could understand, we could understand what would be the input duties that we had to pay for all the, um, the deliveries that we're expecting within the store. Yeah. Um, and uh, because obviously when all these orders were placed, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't very much clarity around the subject. Um, and that's only the one uh, issue, because then if you're running an online business, you know, at the same time you realize, which at that point had become essential tool for retail businesses to be able to sell because of COVID, you know, most of the times we had closures of our physical spaces, um, which meant that the only other uh, place that we could possibly sell was our online stores. And all of a sudden, um, the customers, our customers, you know, in Europe uh, are served with bills, you know, that they have to pay input, <coughs> input duties um, on top of the price that we're selling the products. Uh, it, it was extremely, extremely, extremely complicated, uh, very difficult and hurt the business uh, very, very much financially speaking. So, um, yeah, it was, it wasn't uh, by no means anything uh, nice to even remember. It took very long time until we managed to understand how we can overcome this. Well, uh, let's remember that, that Brexit was delivered over Christmas in 2020 slash 21, wasn't Correct. it? Correct. So uh, let's remember we were in lockdown. Yeah. So uh, we couldn't be together. We were stressed enough about, you know, health and safety and, uh, and the, the, the situation with, with, with COVID. And all of a sudden we realized that everything was changing in a matter of days. I, as a CEO, um, took all the advice I could. And, and unfortunately, this was one of the situations where my comprehension was not sufficient. In fact, I, I bet on an easy Brexit, mm -hmm. uh, which shouldn't have disrupted the operations, deliveries and transport um, of goods. And I found myself with an emergency plan. And yes, we had access to good and expensive advice from the service industry in the UK. But essentially, from December 2020 to January 2021, we had to establish a bonded warehouse mm -hmm. to accept the goods. Yeah. Then you might remember, we have to took all these goods on, uh, on tracks and sending them to Dover, mm -hmm. to Calais, mm -hmm. and then and crossing to Calais. And then we had to open uh, a warehouse in France. Guess what the price and the cost of opening a warehouse in France, where you have no other choices than doing that, yeah. was that added cost, complication in operation, uh, possible mistakes, uh, and five weeks of delays in deliveries. Five weeks of delays in deliveries in a market where retailers are shut down because of COVID <laughs> and consumers are buying online at the best price possible at the fastest delivery as possible. So the financial impact um, to tomorrow's group was significant and the delay in service was significant. It took us until 
September 2021, mm-hmm. when we finally conceded and accepted that the central warehouse of tomorrow would have moved out of Birmingham and, and to Italy, that we, we, we didn't recover to a decent, uh, let's say, um, operational efficiency. And, and may I add on top of this is because the time period that we're all discussing about, because again, it was during COVID, meant that way less people were actually working at that point to be able yeah. to deal with, with all uh, the matters that um, Stefano was describing. For example, you had uh, way less people, you know, in office when it came to deliveries, to uh, accounting, to, 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 to every different sector. There were so many reductions in terms of who was in office to be able to deal with those things. And so it was, it was I think, an, an extremely complicated um, period, very negative period and very, very stressful period. And uh, in, in our case, or in my case, at least as Machine, um, as I said, I was lucky enough and grateful, grateful enough to, to be able to share this burden, this, this decision-making process um, with, uh, with, with a group and at least, you know, back and forth, find the right decision. But there were so many uh, designers that I was talking to, you know, young, young designers at that period of time, which it was almost impossible for them to know what was the right thing to do. And of course, the British Russian Council have tried to support as much as possible, you know, the, everything that everyone had to do at that period of time, but still was uh, really, really difficult, I think, in terms of production, in terms of, you know, fabrication, in terms of uh, materials and so forth, everything. The bottom line was that everything went very, very expensive and cost that I don't think any businesses have uh, accounted for or expected. Well, and the British fashion industry is made up of lots of small businesses. It's fragmented, right? So, you know, there's all of these small businesses. I think there was a move from some to try and perhaps produce more in the UK because Mm -hmm. then, okay, you don't have to deal with the country of origin Mm -hmm. issue. but the the infrastructure is, you know, is relatively limited in terms of, you know, I don't think we can suddenly up demand overnight um, here. So it felt like that kind of just held so many of these smaller businesses back and they were left, you know, kind of floundering. And there is data now showing that the, the exports from the UK into the EU did significantly drop, as mm-hmm. you would anticipate given all of this you know and if you're talking about a small brand that doesn't perhaps have backing of you know good retail partners or mm-hmm. investors then you know they had no choice but to stop selling in the EU altogether and just mm-hmm. you know focus on what they could do here but it's a relatively small market it I mean for, a, for a small brands how do you scale if you can't it is a remember expand into the EU. You're so right on that because I remember even even to us, you know, a lot of discussions were, oh, you. I mean, I kept reading and I was trying to find what is the best way to do it, and it's like, oh, you can cater to the domestic market. And I said, but the domestic market has been always a very small portion of actually what brings right. business to London. Um, for a retailer being based in London, um, is, is one of the most multicultural cities in the world uh, with the most international travel- travelers in the world. Um, so how do you specifically cater only to domestic market without thinking that you have to reconsider your whole model in terms of business uh, of, what, of what actually you, know, you, can, uh, you can achieve? Uh, within this new way. On top of this, for us, and I know that it's a, it's a burden topic for all of us here, um, is that at the same time they voted one of the worst, <laughs> worst uh, 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 laws that I think, with no sense or very little sense, that it was destroyed even the last hope that the retail businesses had to survive in London, and I know that people think that this is over dramatic, but it's not, um, which is basically the cancel the tax free. Yeah, um, it was it it brought such um, uh, a devastating moment to all the big retailers uh, in London for all the obvious reasons. But of course, you know, if the audience wants a bit, you know, to understand a bit more on this, 
is means pretty much that um, an international customer that visits London and shops, they cannot anymore ask for tax free. And people a lot of times think about, well, how much money that could be, you know, like, I mean, I'm sure, you know, um, uh, customers can absorb this. And I'm like, not really, you know, the big spenders and the people that actually buy uh, fashion, you know, especially here in, in, in London, um, it was a really big deal to them. And yeah. it should be a big deal to them. You know, if, if they can claim back the tax, why they shouldn't? Uh, so instead, why they should come to London and spend their money where they can take a day trip to Paris, Milan, exactly. and any other European city. Two hours on the Eurostar. Yeah, two hours in a Eurostar. But this is if, I don't know if anyone has been in Eurostar recently, I've been, you know, you see all these people with massive shopping bags, yeah. you know, like that they, it's, it's obvious this is a day trip. They went in the morning, they come back in the yeah. evening with massive shopping bags. Why? Because, you know, in Paris you can get your tax free. So there is no reason whatsoever unless you want to really destroy the retail businesses in London, you know, to be able to vote something like this. Uh, I, I believe there must be a bias on the idea that the luxury consumers are, you know, a niche and they cater to a very elitish, elitist um, industry, which is not. Uh, the fashion industry is, is, you know, formed by hundreds of thousands of hardworking people mm. with uh, low to middle to high wages, um, finding yourself as a British operator, whether being a licensing partner, manufacturing distributors or retailer, and all of a sudden being between a rock and a hard place. You cannot export and you cannot sell domestically because you are less convenient than a competing country. Let's name names. Paris yeah. got the biggest shares of luxury consumption out of London. Of course, there has been uh, a resurgence of the domestic spend uh, until the cost of living crisis mm -hmm. eat, because that, mm -hmm. that, the, 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 life, the one in a lifetime events which have been affecting the industry and everybody's life, of course, more largely, has been, uh, have been a number. So COVID, Brexit, tax refund cancellations, cost of living crisis. If you put all of these together and you think that this is one of the most expensive cities in the world where to run a yeah. business with the you know most expensive rental and the most expensive employment costs, uh, all of a sudden you realize that you really need to, to be extremely laser focused and you have to own a niche of consumers to be able to survive, not to thrive because I mean, it, if it wasn't enough, I mean, we've seen what happens to the retail in the UK, right? It's, it's obvious. It is obvious what happened to the multi-brand online retailers, which were based in, in the UK. And I'm saying where, because now they have logistics centers outside of the UK, most of it. I can talk to you about the tomorrow experience. Um, since 2015, our decision was to make the UK our operating Headquarter and tomorrow always had subsidiaries around the world. Specifically, we have a subsidiary in Milan since 2011. The co-founders are Italians. I would say a third of the employment of the employees are Italian. So we we have a connection to the to, yeah. to the country. Uh, but we made a decision because yes, the UK is a way more business friendly environment for business. So there's absolutely a large number of reasons to be here access to talent, which unfortunately now is limited, uh, diversity, cultural integration, excitement, energy. There were so many reasons for us to be here. Uh, but the truth is that it is impossible. So you can have a centralized headquarter and you can generate IP here. Absolutely. You can design, you can strategize, you can conceive marketing campaigns, you can build content. Yes, of course. But then when it comes to making something, stuff, mm -hmm. it is impossible. Think about those parcels of DHL, which goes back and forth to Italy or the Eastern European countries or Portugal, where the manufacturing sites are, and the cost of a DHL, you know, uh, 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 shipment. The fabric goes back and forth, the first sample goes back and forth, then a second proto goes back and yeah. forth, and so on and so forth. And nobody knows what are the duties, how to deal with the VAT, what's going to be the cost of the samples in the end. So 
the easiest of the solution is that you just relocate and you manufacture in Europe, you have people traveling from the UK to Europe, running all the operations inside. So yes, you can keep the brain in, uh, in the UK, but the doing, it's rather impossible. But then people aren't going to start up their businesses here anymore. That's my concern is that, you know, what's the incentive to do that? If you, you might as well just do it from the EU in the first place. And we've got such amazing fashion schools here. I know one of the things we're going to talk about as emerging designers, you don't want people graduating and who could be the, the entrepreneurs of the future and going, you, you can, but I'm going to move you can see, to Milan. We have, we have, you know, experiences in Hangai. We have showrooms, we have a store, we have friends. How many of those Chinese uh, graduates are now flying back to China and building their own yeah. businesses in Shanghai instead of London? Uh, but I think this is a whole a topic there, you know, with, with, with emerging designers, because um, uh, th there are so many different stages where it affects them so negatively, even now through their student years. I mean, first of all, the, the emerging design, the emerging designers, the, the fashion students, London is one of the strongest, probably the strongest city in the world of uh, having that incredible pool of talent, yeah. of young talent, because of the incredible universities. Uh, they, of course, attract that talent internationally and globally. Uh, we have the best universities, fashion universities in the world, in this in this city. Now, what has become extremely complicated and difficult and, 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 and a very negative scenario for these fashion students is, number one, one of the biggest parts of the education is to be able to travel and get again internships in Europe, you know, in big fashion houses, you know, that they can go there, you know, like take a semester out, take a year out and be able, you know, to work for all the big luxury fashion houses. Now, this has become extremely complicated because of the visa. You know, they, 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 they are required visa to get to, to do this. Um, and um, and also, you know, like to be able, if, if, if they get in the future a job there, again, it's going to be like an extremely difficult scenario for them to do. The second part is, of course, as everything else in the cost of living crisis that we are into, everything else has gone super expensive, mm -hmm. uh, crazy expensive, almost in an unaffordable level. Um, I'm, I'm part of the BFC scholarships um, for, for, for fashion, for, um, uh, students, uh, fashion students. And, um, one of the biggest issues is that the students, they don't have access anymore to grants, you know, that they're supposed to get in the past from, because we were part of the European Union. So the, the, the issues are starting in a much, much younger stage rather than even, you know, them considering starting their own business in London. I mean, even while they are in the, in the, in the student years, they have to already deal that they need visas in order to go into their internships. They need, for the people that cannot afford the studies, they cannot get any grants. Um, so it's, it's all becoming a very, very negative scenario already for them. And I'm sure, you know, they, 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 they put them off from even considering doing their own brand in the future. Yeah. Um, and I, I see that more and more and more. I think we see that a lot of times. I'm sure you experience that. Back in the day, there were much more designers that they were willing to create their own brands. Um, very well deserve and skillful people that they want to create their own brands. And I think less and less people are thinking something like that at this stage. Um, considering everything that we're discussing about. Yeah, and I think the cost of living crisis and everything else we've talked about, it's all this sort of perfect storm, isn't it? We've written quite a bit about, with emerging designers in particular at the moment, they, t you know, because London, it really relies on those emerging names, those buzzy emerging names to show at Fashion Week to bring that, you know, element of excitement. And, and yet all of these designers are telling us that they're really really struggling you know there's there's fantastic support there but it's it's still the 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 kind of whole ecosystem around them isn't really Work. conducive to to long-term success right because what do you do when the funding or the grant does run out mm -hmm. if you've got it um or if you can't get investment so we have these designers you know there's just so much hustle going on to to put on shows 
London was always uh, had that feeling of, you know, like okay. young designers in it together, you know, scrappy, doing what they could to put on a show. And that was a lovely, you know, that it's always been that lovely, like camaraderie. But now it feels like it's really okay. I have to find sponsorship here and, and, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit of money here and use all my savings here just to put on this show. And I don't know if I can do the next one. It's become a lot more acute, I think. And we're seeing more and more designers now just having to skip a season last minute. You know, Delara was a recent example. There have been plenty of examples mm -hmm. of designers kind of going, do you know what? It doesn't make sense for me at the moment to do this. Um, so I'm going to take a break and I'll, you know, be back next season. But if we keep putting them in this, kind of position, then, you know, we're not, how, how can we possibly expect to have any bigger brands come out of London or brands that have that kind of staying power? We're not well, setting them up for success. Well, well you know, let, let's start with statistics, right? Uh, in, in the high-end fashion, you have Barbary, then you have Paul's Meat, and then you have J.W. Anderson, Martin Rose, Cold Wall, um, forgive me if I forget anyone in the high-end fashion. So it is really limited. And I, I mentioned two brands which are part of, you know, the tomorrow partnerships because unsurprisingly, two out of three are is sponsored by tomorrow and the third, J.W. Anderson has a, an LVMH investment into it. Yeah. So that's a testimony that uh, there is something which is breaking between a, a great beginning. The schools are amazing, we all know. The support system, the British Fashion Council, um, Vogue, the people involved in mentorship in all these grants and awards. And I mean, this is one of the best environment in the world yeah. to learn yeah. creativity and to express yourself freely. There, there's, a, there's a sense of, there's a feeling of you can do it and you can do it as, as weirdly as you want and you will be uh, acknowledged, recognized, appreciated. And that's something I learned coming from Milan, where the establishment is exactly what it is. I left Milan when I was 37 years old and I was young, like very young <laughs> in Milan. I yeah. came here and I was a bit late to come here. I say, yeah, what, what is this middle-aged man once in London? <laughs> so there, there, there's a difference, which I think, uh, again, it's, it's fantastic. London is amazing, but there is something which, which cracks in, in the process. Because yeah, uh, in a way, tomorrow has established itself as the incubator and accelerator in London, mm. but quite frankly, we could have been anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if we weren't here, what is the alternative to it? And I'm not saying that we are, you know, the, the only opportunity, but I don't see many opportunities for them or to get an LVMH or Caring or Richmond or, whatever other institution investment. Um, so we have to interrogate ourselves and understanding why the best country in the world to develop early stage creativity produces so very few large scale success businesses. Yeah, it's, it's a very valuable point. And I think, I think I mean, what, what we said here, you know, like in terms of you know, it's 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 actually very interesting what you just said, Stefano, because um, you start here. This is an incredible city, and I hope like everyone understands that we all talk out of love for this city. Right. I made it my second home. You know, here for the last fifteen years, um, this is what I was drawn into into this city, and I see also a lot of wonderful, incredible people. And you have to give it for the British Fashion Council for New Gen for fashionists, for people like Sarah Moore and, and, and Caroline Rush and so many other individuals that are coming together and have given their lives to support emerging talent. Yeah. Um, and each one of us want, you know, to be in, in a city that uh, evolves into the better. And for sure, Brexit doesn't feel for any, any of us, or at least for me, that moved us to a better place. And uh, I really hope that there could be a solution in the future of, um, of perhaps trying to change something extremely negative into something positive. How? That's the big question, isn't it? That's I mean, aside from sorting out, you know, simplifying some of the Brexit yeah. 
you rules know, and regulations. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm reading newspapers like everybody else. I don't have any insight in the... <laughs> <laughs> in the yeah, I'm not expecting However, us to have this like, sessions, exactly. But. It looks like there are a number of industries where they, you know, they are going back to the European-like regulation. I would love to see more investment in, you know, incentivizing good practice, training, skills, upskilling, um, you know, just that kind of a bit more of the proactive side of it as well. So let's sort out the issues that are there, but then let's, let's look at what do we need. Investment, obviously, from the government would be great, but, you know, business guidance, and that's something I think we've talked about before, mm -hmm. and I know the BFC spoken about the need for you know, um, larger businesses to get involved and help with mentoring. And, you know, we need, we have the business ecosystem here. Mm. So actually let's tap into it. Let's get those emerging designers in particular that are struggling that kind of support that they need so that they're not coming out these, you know, fresh eyed creatives with this amazing talent. They're not coming out of university and just being kind of you know, off you go, you either fly or don't. They are getting that support all the way through and it's not necessarily always tied to, you know, having to win in a certain fund or award or something like that. And I think that would be an amazing step. We've we've sort of seen that happen a little bit. You know, Ghani just took a break from showing at Copenhagen and part of mm. what they spent their money on was supporting some of the emerging designers coming yeah. through. I love seeing things like that. It's like the industry is coming up with its own ways of trying to, to help, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than always Absolutely. relying on the government to do something which might take a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm always a dreamer, so, <laughs> and, um, and I would like to believe that, uh, I always believed in the young generation of people. Uh, and where we fail, I think they're coming to fix things for us. Yeah. Um, so I really hope that there is going to be a momentum where everyone everyone has realized how bad Brexit has been, you know, but it could be a momentum where it could switch quite a lot of things because the power is with the people, it's not with the governments. So people should remember that, always remember that the power is with uh, the citizens. Um, hopefully they, it can be a big change because, and I'm not saying that European Union is a perfectly well-built system not. You know, like it, that, right. that, that, <laughs> that, that, that resolves every single uh, issue <laughs> that exists, uh, by far isn't. Um, however, and it, this is a big however, being part of something as big as European Union and, and have a, a support as, as it has been for the last uh, 40 or 50 years, prove to be something much bet better and much greater for UK, uh, for, for, for uh, England and London, rather than being a part of it. So I hope the young generation of people and us push as much as we can our government, uh, our future government, to yeah. change things in, in a drastic way. I keep reading that mm -hmm. people reconsidering, so, yeah. Well, and there might be fewer people setting up their own businesses, but the, the emerging designers and established designers we have here do certainly seem resilient. You know, the the ones that are kind of, they keep, they're keep going, they find random sponsorships or yeah, sure. keep challenging the ways yeah. of doing things. You know, um, I think we're still, we're still able to make a name for ourselves. I think about some of the designers that are going out there and really pushing um, size inclusivity, for example, mm -hmm. and really setting the agenda. And they're, you know, London-based brands going out there and talking about really important things and um, and people are taking notes. So there is that opportunity to kind of, I think, push a lot of different benefits that you can get in this country of, you know, we do breed designers that challenge the status quo. Oh my gosh. And yeah. we need that, we need that across Europe and the globe. That, that is the point. We would like to see them flourishing. Yeah. Because the larger the business, the wider the audience, the stronger the message. And I mean, it, it's easy to see that inclusivity in the fashion industry started from London. And it was interesting, liberating, exciting, new. Uh, don't we want those businesses to become way larger and employing more people and paying more taxes? Mm -hmm. and? And, and providing support to their communities. Why are we not in the position to, to help them more and better? Um, you just mentioned random sponsorship. 
which you get until you don't. Yeah. And the moment you don't, exactly. you skip a season. What happens? The moment you skip a season, you're off the radar. The moment you're off the radar, you might look for a job because you know life is much easier if you as a designer end up in the design studio of a multi-billion business. You don't have to wake up in the morning thinking about invoices you need to pay the next day. But we don't want all of these people to be employed. We want them to build something. Thinking about, because I'm conscious that we've, you know, we've talked about, so there's so many challenges facing the industry now. Um, so let's end on a more positive forward facing note. Mm -hmm. What is your kind of thought about, you know, going into 2024 and beyond? What's your kind of hope for the industry? Hmm. Um, I think it's, 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 it's a difficult year and it's a challenging year for many uh, socio-political reasons very well known to all of us. Um, uh, but I always believe in, in being a human and, and having, you know, the, again, I'm going to talk about the young generation of people that they're coming together, um, that they always think about new ways that the system and where the system fails can be fixed. Um, you said it earlier that uh, a designer might choose to skip a season, do something different, find a sponsorship from something else. They always ways to build something from what we thought that this is the only way to do things. Um, and um, I really think that because of how difficult everyone's experiences have been in the last three years and how difficult it is this year as well, um, I think there is uh, a good understanding of a situation of somebody. So I think um, uh, supporting each other and making sure you know we, we will be able to navigate through this complexities and complicated situations, we can go somewhere way more positive. Um, it would be a great shame, you know, and I don't think it's going to happen for London uh, because it is the most incredible city that I have experienced throughout the whole world um, of having such um, a massive pool of talent that exists in this, in this city. And I only hope that we will be able to build the right foundations of what it means in 2024 uh, to support them in the right manner. And I think if we're going to take any silver lining, grasp at one from Brexit, from COVID, is that, you know, it did, it has made us question the system and, and how yeah. the system of, of production, and that's what young designers are so great at in yeah. London, they come through and they, they question, you know, should we be doing these shows? Should I be exporting to the EU? All these things we're saying, oh, you know, this is a problem. They're going, well, hold on, maybe we do things differently. Exactly. You know, so the challenge really breeds that innovation, which I think is incredible. And so as long as we can have, continue to bring through that pool of talent, yeah. and then we have people like yourselves, because, you know, you talked about all the people that support emerging designers, mm -hmm. but you two both do as much of, of that as anyone else. So as long as we have people who are still willing to support as well as those emerging designers come through, then I think, you know, I've got a lot of hope for the future, but I'm an optimist. So, Same. so yeah. thanks. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.